um, industry in particular around sharing and working together and improving workplace road safety. It's all about collaborating, uh, information, key risks and how different organisations work through that solution and then coming to the optimal sort of good practice areas. So this webinar uh, today is the result of a case study uh, which I think we just released a couple of weeks ago and uh, it's exa exactly the sort of goals and aims that the program wants to produce. So thank you all for taking part today. Thank you, Jerome. And uh, as I just said, I'll just uh, finish up on a few more housekeeping items. So this session is being recorded and the video together with the presentation material will be sent to you on conclusion of the session. For first time webinar attendees, please see some helpful tips on your screen. Please note the questions box and chat box in particular, there we go, uh, the chat box in particular uh, where you will type in any questions, comments or feedback for the presenters or perhaps for Jerome or myself. Now speaking of the presenter, the man of the hour, please join me in welcoming Colin Green or Cole for short to the microphone. Welcome Cole. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? the organisation and what our listeners can expect to learn from today's session. Yes, thank you Angela. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I come from a mechanical background. Um, I started my apprenticeship way back in 1973 with the Forestry Commission and uh, ended up leaving after many years, 18 years I think it was there, as actual workshop foreman. So I've had a bit of a, bit of a play around with um, vehicles and, and whatnot there. Um, I came to Community Transport in about 2009 um, as uh, Fleet Manager, Training and Work Health and Safety Coordinator. Uh, I still am in that role but it's a different name, it's called Assets and Safety Manager now. Um, with, the, uh, with the presentation today, I, I just want to try and bring you through what we, we do with our organisation with volunteers. So who are we? Coffs Harbour Belgian Nambuk Community Transport uh, are located on the north coast of uh, New South Wales. Uh, we have 33 vehicles in our um, transport fleet, um, four Rosa type buses, a one sprinter, nine commuters and the rest of the vehicles are made up of Subaru Foresters, Camrys, an I-30 on one day and a, and a few Kias. We travel up to a million kilometres per annum and nearly 84,000 trips these days, um, which is a pretty good effort, uh, or we feel, on the north coast. We are supported by 80 volunteers and 8 paid drivers. Um, and we used to use personal uh, volunteer vehicles, but we've phased that out. Um, and it's only very rare to use a volunteer vehicles. Uh, the taxis, uh, we spend approximately 3,700 per month for out of hours and weekend services where we, uh, we've got the door shut. Just speak a bit about volunteers. Um, we've, we've worked out there's about, there's three styles of volunteer. The first style is the volunteer who wants to contribute or give back to the community. These are the most motivated and keen to fit into the organisation. They, they're, uh, they're driven to do something for the community. The other type of volunteer is uh, one who volunteers because of Centrelink obligations uh, to volunteer uh, community services 15 hours per week. These volunteers usually become like the, uh, the first volunteer I spoke of. The volunteer who volunteers purely for the money gained using their own vehicle uh, really don't have the community's best interests at heart um, and we have mainly phased those type of volunteers out um, and uh, we, we've we got the um, the volunteers that really want to volunteer for the community. <coughs> Bit of an observation, the volunteers volunteer their time and efforts for their reasons, not ours. Uh, that's a very important message I want to get across. Uh, we provide them with a safe workplace, the infrastructure to volunteer, their services to the community. As an organisation, our duty of care is volunteers first, then the passengers that we transport. If the passengers' needs impact on the drivers, um, or the drivers' work health and safety considerations, um, we, we sometimes are not able to transport that passenger, and therefore maybe refuse transport. 
We operate in the, as I said, in the north coast. Um, as you can see in front of you, the, the blue area, we, we go north to the um, other side of Corindai, Red Rock, a little locality, to the south of Nambucca, and out the west towards Dorigo. This encompasses three local government areas, Coffs Harbour, Bellingen and Nambucca. Each uh, LDA, LGA has a little bit of different um, uh, transport needs, mainly around Coffs it's short runs and, and uh, drop off to hospitals, um, doctor surgeries and, and the like, and very short infrequent runs. Our centres from Bellingen and uh, Nambucca are mainly a little bit longer run and it's, it's usually a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with the passenger and, and volunteer going to, the, to Coffs uh, and waiting and then returning the passenger home. Bellingen up in the Tablelands, up in the Dorigo area, uh, it operates more in a rural setting on the, on the plateau uh, and they also transport the coughs to Bellingen. We also travel out to other regional areas like Port Macquarie and Lismore and even the Gold Coast uh, for, for uh, people's um, needs to, um, to access professional services. What motivated us to, to look at work health and safety driving? Um, high incident rate um, is, is one of the triggers. Um, across the organisation uh, we have um, quite, a, quite a few mileages covered every day by the vehicles. Um, as I said, 150 to 200 kilometres per vehicle per day. That exposes our drivers to probably one of the most hazardous uh, work environments uh, you could ever find, and that's the open road or the uh, the highway. Uh, we have no real control on uh, what the other driver's doing, what the um, weather is doing, or, or or the like. So uh, it's, it's very important that we uh, recognise the drivers are, are working in a very very um, high risk area. We had a bit of a thing going when I first came to community transport uh, that the work health and safety was mainly um, the Coffs Harbour's responsibility or the main office. Everyone looked to the office for uh, all the work health and safety needs, um, more or less giving people the idea it's not their problem. Um, that was the first thing we recognised which needed to be addressed. Uh, so what we did, we actually moved our uh, work health and safety committee out into the um, the other offices so we we had a rotation we involved the coordinators at those offices and we slowly started to bring everybody on to being responsible and taking ownership of work health and safety originally it was sort of an ad hoc affair with uh, things just left up to the drivers Where we really shone was we had a buy-in from the top and that is from our board of management, uh, our CEO and, and managers. Uh, we all took a, a very strong role in recognising how work health and safety, especially on the road, uh, was such an important item. Uh, with, the, uh, with the board coming behind us, it, it really, really made a big difference to our work health and safety committee. Um, along with that, the board has also adopted in our strategic plan, uh, we discuss work health and safety at every meeting, no matter what it is, if it's, if it's a driver meeting, if it's uh, a group meeting of, of staff, the first item of business is work health and safety um, before any other uh, subject is, um, is, is broached. Um, with the strong support of the board, it's relatively easy to promote a safe work culture among the staff and volunteers. Um, this is ongoing and still being um, implemented as we go. We're still uh, moving along. <coughs> we established the, a very strong work health and safety committee and must deliver outcomes. What I mean by that is we we used a, a model where we had drivers or volunteer drivers from each of the local government areas be representative on our work health and safety committee. 
we had staff representatives, we had some board representatives, and also we've got a couple of uh, ex drivers who've, who've been out of the um, uh, work, uh, community transport for quite a time. Uh, they're very handy because they actually have fresh eyes when they look in and what we're doing. Um, with the with the committee, um, we are a little bit unique being volunteers, and when when everything changed from OHS over to work health and safety, um, the actual um, keeping of uh, work health and safety committee was uh, um, more or less a HR role. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to um, work cover about our unique situation where we have 80 volunteers and, and about 20 maximum staff and they were really good. They come behind us and they said, look, I wouldn't change what you're doing. You've, you're meeting, you're ticking all the boxes and, and really uh, producing some good stuff. So what we did, we had a formal structure for all our drivers. Um, Originally when drivers come on board it was a, a bit of a ad hoc situation where um, we, we took them on, we had varying induction processes and all that. Uh, what we did, we formalised that induction process. We've actually got a process now where when a driver or, or a volunteer comes on board, um, he's first of all taken through uh, an induction manual. Uh, from that manual, uh, all the uh, criminal record checks, driver checks and all that needs to be filled out. And then we send the driver with an experienced driver, a driver who's been doing the job for quite a while. Um, the advantage of this is sometimes people, they have a, a differing idea of what community transport actually does and when they actually go out and see what we do and the way we um, transport people and that. We have had a few cases where volunteers have come back and said, no, this is really not, not for me. I didn't realise what was involved. Um, so, so they've quite happily moved on and, and we haven't lost anything by giving them the experience. So that's our, our main, main way of, of um, training. We, we keep ongoing mentoring once they come on board. We, we give them a small job to do, to send them out and, and then we uh, check how they're going with that and gradually bring them into the system. We were very fortunate um, in our organisation. We obtained some funding to um, produce a training DVD uh, and the training DVD is, is virtually, um, if you like, a, an electronic copy of our driver manual. We've shared that with everybody and it's, um, everyone's welcome to, to pick up that website on YouTube. Uh, if you don't want to write that down, all you need to do is um, type in community transport driver training and you'll find our uh, DVD. It's only a 14 minute um, DVD but it gives a pretty clear picture on what we're about and what we need to do. With our drivers, their age is around the, f the 50s to the 70s, 75. Um, mostly retired drivers, uh, retired from um, uh, their, their normal business or jobs, whatever they're doing in the, in the life before. Uh, they have become really, really um, unique and, and um, just, just what we need to, uh, to do the job. They can relate to older people, uh, they have compassion and aside from that we also have them go through a driver assessment. We use the services of a um, driver training school uh, from, from the central um, district, Moree area. Um, they, they come down once, once or twice a year depending on how many drives we need to go through and they take the driver for a 40 minute to an hour uh, session 
driving. And what they're looking for is how well they know the road rules, how, how well they drive, how smooth they drive. Remembering we're carrying people who are, who are frail aged, um, have disabilities. Then we get a, a report back from the driving assessor whether the driver are confident or not confident. Most places if they got a not confident would probably ask the driver to move on. We in fact offer the driver uh, extra training at our cost so they can pick up their, uh, their game if you like and mostly it's only a small small matter uh, like negotiating roundabouts or something like that so we actually pick those people up and give them extra training. Those that don't want to take on the training, I think they know more than the uh, assessor and that, uh, we offer them other duties if they wish in our community transport, uh, i.e. bus carers or, or the like, but we don't let them drive anymore. Um, and, and that's been a bit of a, bit of a risk um, management thing. Just a little bit of a story of what happened uh, in the last few years. Um, when I first came along to community transport, our presentation was pretty poor. We used to have uh, volunteers uh, with sandals, thongs, the like. Uh, very few wore our, our blue shirt uniform. And it made it very hard for people, especially elderly people at hospital waiting areas and doctor's surgeries to identify the driver. We uh, embarked on a program of um, tidying up the, uh, the footwear problem it, it, and we actually had to get strong enough to say if you don't wear covered footwear we really can't have you driving for us. That's how strong we had to speak. The uniforms were taken up by the drivers uh, which was really good because it gave us a real professional look in the, in the community. The drivers um, came to me uh, a few times at different meetings and said, can we get volunteer um, embossed onto the shirt? And you think, well, what do you want volunteer on for? And what they were really about was they were so proud of being a volunteer driver that they wanted the receptions at the doctor's surgeries and that to recognise that they weren't doing it for money. They were actually volunteering their services. And I thought that was a pretty pretty important thing to support and uh, uh, it just enhanced the ownership, if you like, of the drivers of community transport and our work health and safety ethic. With our branding, we had 33 vehicles running around town with no branding. And once again, it was an identity problem. Uh, we, we actually fitted up uh, the CTO um, corporate logo uh, with our um, locations underneath and that immediately gave us a presence in the community. We had so many calls from people that didn't realise we had so many vehicles, didn't realise we were about so many places. It's been a bit of an advantage too because we get to know if our drivers are out there doing something that's probably they shouldn't be doing, we sometimes get a phone call and it's not hard to sort of track down and speak to the driver about that. Do we have any questions? Oh, thank you, Cole. Um, we do actually have a couple of questions, so uh, Jerome and I will uh, shoot those through to you if you, if you don't mind. Uh, I will take this opportunity to um, to remind our wonderful listeners that the, you know this is your opportunity to to get that insight from uh, Cole. So please don't be shy at any stage to send through any thoughts you might have. Just keen to know, Cole. Um, so you talk about in general the response from volunteers to these WHS changes were quite positive, which is fantastic. But was there any pushback? Because like I'm sure all of our listeners can relate to you know, I guess some um, changes within an organisation, not everyone embraces that very well. So did you get any pushback and if so, how did you deal with that? Well, certainly. We had, um, we, you know, we have uh, volunteers coming from all different walks of life and when we, we undertake training, as, as like any organisation, we must provide training for our people 
I, I got some negative comments from volunteers. I've been in this job all this time. I don't need training. <laughs> or I get the other volunteers that says, you're doing manual handling. I actually teach manual handling in SES. And my response to that person was, well, I need you to go along and see if our trainer is doing a good job. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't <laughs> buck it. Uh, it was, it was not, a, not a negotiable thing. Um, and as I said, we speak strongly. If, if we do get the volunteer that really, really doesn't want to do um, training, doesn't want to, uh, if you like, embrace work health and safety, well, we need to find somewhere else for that volunteer to go. Um, it's, it's really, that's, import, that's how important, and that's why I say with the backing of the board, that's how important our organisation considers work health and safety. Um, so quite, quite, quite a few times I've, uh, I've had to say to some of our volunteers, look, this is, this is how it is. You're either going to have to go undergo the training or we're going to have to let you move on. Most of the time everyone comes on board. And then yeah. the silly part is after they've had the training, they had such a great time, they learnt so much and they come back with all positive stuff and it really uh, sits you on your bum sometimes, really, to to think, well, it was so hard to get them there, and then they they're embracing it. That's fantastic, thank you, Cole. Um, so we've got a question here from Stuart, and he says, "What systems do you have to cover a patient who vomits in the bus on the trip home after they've had chemo or radiation therapy or any of those sort of issues?" So I guess that's drawing to the practical sort of elements. Oh yeah. It does happen. Accidents do happen, um, especially with um, hospital patients. We have uh, spill kits. Uh, most of the all the vehicles have uh, uh, M bags or, or sick bags, uh, spill kits. If um, if they've had a real um, problem or we've had a blood issue, um, usually we take the the passenger, if if it's if it's a, a serious enough thing, we'll take them to a, a hospital or uh, to a doctor's surgery, or if they're okay to get them home, we'll get them home. We'll take the vehicle off the road and go and uh, get the thing cleaned out, uh, washed and disinfected, ready for the next uh, next passenger. We we take it straight off the, the road and do do a clean up, if you like. But fortunately, we haven't had too many incidents. Um, where where people have, have been that way. Usually they can let us know when they're starting to feel a bit unwell and we soon pull an M bag out of the glove box and here hang on to this and and really the uh, um, bodily fluids are sort of contained. And how do you actually, um, another question here, how do you actually manage the enthusiasm of your drivers? Because these people are so altruistic, so keen to help. How do you temper their enthusiasm, keeping them sort of Professional, I suppose. Professional, yeah. but also, I guess, in there, not sort of <laughs> overexerting themselves as well. Okay, with the overexertion, we we have a policy for just about everything, but uh, we have a three-day policy for for our drivers, um, where we don't want them in, in in any one week. We we sort of limit them to three days in that week, just purely because of the uh, driving load on on the road. Um, with with passengers, sometimes we do get the need where we've got to actually ask a volunteer to go for a four day because of a um, few volunteers have, have gone and taken holidays, which you believe uh, they do that from time to time. And we actually uh, keep a very close eye on them and make sure they're only doing a one trip for the day or something like that. It's just to try and keep um, their fatigue down at least. Uh, with their enthusiasm, um, we do have, get the trouble where I get um, drivers that want to drive five days a week. This is their life, they tell me. There's, there's nothing nothing more they want to do but just transport people. We've got to temper those people back and say, listen, we've got to be fair. Other people want to volunteer their services as well and share it around. Thanks. Leo. One last question, I guess, before we sort of move on, um, so we can keep delving in. Our vehicles, from, this one's from David. Are vehicles able to use accessible parking spaces? Yes, uh, we have a um, um, the mobility parking scheme with the RMS. Uh, we have um, uh, mobility stickers for our uh, all of our vehicles. However, we we have a strict rule that we only 
display that um, mobility parking when we actually have a person who is mobility uh, challenged who can't um, can't access anything. You know, it's, it's it's a bit unfair to um, throw a sticker on our vehicles and roar into a mobility parking zone and then leave the vehicle and walk off. Um, we frown very hard on that. Uh, we only uh, specify that if we're actually carrying a person with a mobility problem, we then put the sticker on on the uh, windscreen and that allows us to pull up in the uh, mobility parking areas. And certainly you, you, you would frown on that as would many uh, of the bystanders who witnessed it, <laughs> I'm certain. <laughs> Don't worry, we, we, have had, we have had drivers abuse it, um, throw a sticker on and, and leave the vehicle there. We usually find out about it. This is the beauty about having your vehicles uh, marked and uh, we, we soon soon get onto the driver and say, you better move it. Um, it we've, we've got to respect the community because it's not only us in the community and it's not only us that uh, carries people with mobility issues. Thank you so much, David, for your question, and I hope we've uh, been able to clarify that for you. Um, so, Cole, we look forward to the next stage of the presentation, and then we'll take some more questions later on. Would that be okay? Certainly, Angela. Here we go. What I want to tell you all about now is our wheelchair awareness um, course. Um, this purely come about from a complaint from a passenger um, who's... Uh, confined to a wheelchair, travelling in the back of our commuter um, and was a little bit um, apprehensive about our, our driver um, saying he was driving too fast and over bumps too rough and that really really twigged a um, aha moment if you like um, where it was really evident that our drivers didn't really know what it was like to sit in a wheelchair so we um, we took it took it as far as we could. We I got all the drivers together, and we actually built a wheelchair uh, passenger course. And what that means is we get the driver and we put him in a wheelchair. We utilise the wheelchair lift at the back of the vehicle. Uh, we lift the drivers up into position. We strap the wheelchair down as normal uh, wheelchair practice. We secure the drivers in the wheelchair via the lap belt and we ask the drivers to rest their hands palm up on their lap to simulate someone who hasn't got control of their upper body. Um, I'm usually the, the driver of the vehicle. Uh, I drive the vehicle within the speed limits, uh, within the road rules, but I drive the vehicle harshly, very hard on the brakes, very very um, rough on the corners, round and round about, probably a little bit quicker than I should. And on the edge of the roadway, you wouldn't be, you'd be surprised how rough the edge of a roadway is for a wheelchair passenger. Take them over um, uh, ramps and, and bits and pieces. Then I change my driving style to being a very sedate driver, concerned for, their wheel, for the p wheelchair passenger's comfort taking it very easy over, over uh, ramps, very easy around roundabouts, braking well and truly long before I get to an intersection. And the overall thing that happened, and mind you, this only took about 15 minutes to take these guys for a run around the, around the town. All the drivers, when they got back to the ground, when we got them on the ground and, and that, First of all, they were daunted about the wheelchair lift. They didn't realise it was scary as it was. They didn't realise that the wheelchair passenger had such a bad ride being over the back axle of a commuter. Uh, even when you drive sedately and steadily, it's still not a very pleasant ride. Uh, but all our drivers changed their driving style straight away. Um, and I didn't just leave it with the drivers. I, I took the CEO, I took all our staff, so they all know what the the drivers are contending with when they're transporting people in wheelchairs. So they know they've got to allow a bit of extra time when they're they're allocating uh, trips for people. That there is probably an extra 10, 15 minutes to be able to load and unload passengers. To me, really, that was one of the greatest um, 
work health and safety triumphs, if you like, in our organisation was the the way that this training uh, really helped everybody out. And uh, as I said, all the drivers had no idea it was like that, uh, and they changed their style. As I said, we've got quite a quite a range of vehicles. Uh, we try and regularly turn them over about every four four years. Two hundred thousand is is sort of a a rule of thumb. Sometimes we go over, sometimes we 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 get rid of them a little bit earlier. Um, with the wheelchair modified vehicles, we usually hold them a little bit longer, um, purely for the cost of the wheelchair modification, um, and try and um, use utilise that vehicle as best as possible. Um, maintenance is our our key requirement. Um, originally, when when we first started out, we used to have one um, dealership in Coffs Harbour used to do the servicing on all our vehicles. Uh, it's a bit hard when you've got a um, a vehicle in Bellingen and it has a, has a small problem. You take it to the local friendly garage, and you can understand the the local garage saying, "Well, why don't you take it back to Coffs Harbour and get them to fix it?" So immediately there's a problem. And I like to support the local industry. So we have a system now where our Nambucca vehicles are serviced in Nambucca. Our Belgian vehicles are serviced in Yurunga, and our Coffs Harbour vehicles, Wagooga vehicles, are serviced in Coffs Harbour. We've got a very, very good uh, working relationship with our service providers. They understand how we work. They understand the importance of what we do, transporting people. And you know the best part is we can have a uh, likes of a commuter bus that picks up a, a stone in the in the front disc and makes a bit of a noise. We can drop it off to our service provider, and they usually uh, get their guys straight onto it, pull the wheel off, get the rock out, and we're back on the road within about 20 minutes. And that sort of service you just can't you can't buy. Um, the other thing we we're really strict on, and this is where I involve all the drivers as well, is to keep an eye on the tyres. I can't get round every vehicle we have every day, and I rely on our drivers to. Um, Check, check the vehicle over, check the tyre pressures. But if the tyres are starting to look a little bit worn or, or whatever, um, there's no hesitation. Take them straight to our tyre provider, get them to have a look at it, and they fit new tyres if need be, and, uh, or wheel on it, whatever is required. With our vehicles, it's very, very hard to get an ideal vehicle to transport frail-aged, disabled people. Um, on the slide there in front of you, I've I've nominated and found through experience that a 700 mil seat height from the roadway is just about ideal for for uh, elderly people. The seat needs to be close to the edge of the sill, that so that they can back in and and sit down. Uh, some some vehicles have 200 mil, 250 mil from the edge of the sill to where their seat starts, which is just too far for people to to back into and sit down. The other problem we've got is how high the actual sill panel is. Uh, some vehicles have very, very high sills, makes it hard for elderly patients just to lift their feet up and over. The, <coughs> the problem is there's not one vehicle that has all those features together. So that's why we have a range of vehicles. Uh, as I said, I strive for a seat height of 700 mil. Uh, another another clue for people, most elderly people uh, flat out lifting their feet above 200 mil, like for a step or anything like that. So we try and ensure when we have um, bus conversions and that we have a 200 mil tread height. Um, much over that, it's it's very difficult for, for a lot of elderly people. With our um, Dorigo area up around the... Um, the farming area. Uh, we spe mainly specify uh, Subaru Forester all-wheel drive vehicles, a little bit higher ground clearance, and that allows us to get into um, into the uh, properties and all that sort of caper. We also had a lot of trouble with driveways. Um, our drivers were, were taking the vehicles in, trying to be 
good Samaritans, I guess, to get their passengers as close as they can to their doorway and all that, and they'd drive into driveways. And invariably they'd back round and they'd take out the garden name or the letterbox, or if it was a bus, they'd take down the telephone line going into the property, damaging our vehicles as well as the private property of the, of the client. The board acted on this and they produced a no driveway policy. And that alleviated a lot of problems. However, there are still people who have mobility problems that actually need someone to come into the driveway. Uh, and that's where we come back into it again. We, we use Google Maps and we get down to Street View and have a look at the driveway initially. If it's any way suspect, we actually go out and have an on-site inspection of the driveway. We usually speak to the passenger. And what we look for is a good flat set down area to be able to pick up and set down the passenger. The passenger's needs, whether they um, need a walker or they need a wheelchair, what their actual situation is. And, uh, and that's how we over, override the no driveway policy. A couple of times we've, um, we've actually refused people transport uh, out of their driveway. Um, and they've, they've seen fit to go and speak to the local member and, and say how bad community transport is, we won't come in their driveway. But I'll give you an example of one of the ones that I refused. Um, in Coffs Harbour, we're in a banana growing area and the actual um, driveway into the, into the house was actually a banana track. It had a high bank on, on the left hand side. On the right hand side, it was a, about a hundred feet drop and it was only wide enough for one vehicle. At the end of the drive there was nowhere to turn the vehicle around safely. Uh, it was a real um, dangerous situation and we made the decision, no we're not, we're not actually going into that driveway. The passenger needs to be brought out to the edge of the road and then we can transport. And as, as you can imagine it created a fair bit of a stir among the passenger and, and uh, as they went to the local member but the best part was we upheld our decision because our duty of care is firstly to the driver. Fantastic. We've we got some questions right away. So this is actually making life very easy when you have a nice interactive audience. And this one I'm really keen to hear from uh, Matt Cole. And this came through from Jay. Um, do you notice any difference in car accident types and rates between full-time staff and volunteers at all? No. No, we don't. Um, the our as I said, we only have eight uh, permanent drivers. Uh, the rest of it's uh, made up of volunteers. And honestly, uh, as I get down uh, later on down on the presentation, um, most of our um, our incidents or or accidents, if you really want to go that way, are only of a very minor nature. And most of those are reversing accidents. Um, uh, some might say it's it's more of good luck than good measure. Um, yes, I reckon there's a, probably a bit of luck involved, but I like to think it's our our whole uh, work health and safety policies, the way the drivers have adopted those policies, that are that are part of the organisation that's made all the difference. Fair enough, and thank you, Jay, for that question. I hope we've managed to uh, answer that for you. Another question here from Julie, and Julie's asking, for the longer trips, um, where do we find info on what restrictions there are? Is, is that in regard to um, uh, travelling over, over four hours, over two hours away, I, I imagine? Um, I would gather. And most, most of our our trips um, are within that two hour band. The, on the occasions where we've actually gone uh, to Brisbane and that, sometimes it's been an overnight stay with the driver will actually go with the passenger, stay overnight and then they'll return or, or whatever. Um, but yeah, we try and try and keep an eye on, on all of that. The thing with the, uh, the buses of course, once they go over a hundred Ks from their um, their normal journey place. Um, by rights, they should be having a logbook, um, and uh, most of the time, our vehicles only operating in that um, 
in that uh, local air, localised area, if you like, and we haven't had the uh, the need. Fair enough. Thank you, Julie. All the same. Uh, questions come through from Paul. Do you want to take that one, Jerome? Yeah. I think it's a really interesting one. Well, um, Cole will be touching on that towards the end. So, we can, as, as regards to telematics and um, GPS monitoring, so I know Cole will be touching on that towards where he's going in the future. Um, so, and which one here for Richard, which is probably just um, uh, one we can sort of just draw in quickly. Which, why do you have paid drivers and volunteer drivers? We have paid drivers for those occasions. Um, we do do school transport for um, um, children that need um, disability transport. Uh, under the contracts, you must have paid drivers that, that fulfil those contracts. Um, and also, by having uh, paid drivers, they become a regular... Um, or how you say a stable uh, work working um, group that actually we use those paid drives to do our uh, on-site training when they're taking new volunteers out. So we keep the consistency of our uh, organisation um, in the control of our paid drivers. Uh, as as just to to go a little bit further with a with a paid driver or staff, usually you can ask them to do things that you want them to do. With volunteers, um, you've got to be a bit more pleasant in how you ask them to do things for you. You can't just sort of demand, I want you to go and, and do this. That's, that's not on and, and, uh, and that's the sort of respect that we've, we've learnt to show to our volunteers is we ask them politely if, if they would mind coming along and helping us with a particular transport or whatever. And if the volunteer doesn't feel comfortable transporting a certain passenger or don't, doesn't feel comfortable with the situation, um, the best part is they, they will tell us. They will tell us straight up, no, I don't feel comfortable. Then we know that we've got to start looking at that passenger and, and what's going on. Okay? Do, do you have, a, like, I guess, a, a surplus of volunteers or, or do you have too few? How, how does it sort of balance out for your organisation? It's a feast and a famine, and I'm sure other community transports uh, would agree. Uh, sometimes you've got more volunteers than you know what to do with, and that's where we try and spread work around those volunteers. And then when the weather turns really nice, a lot of the volunteers, as I said, most of them retired um, volunteers, and the lure of going uh, north for the winter and things like that, um, your volunteer base thins out pretty well. So. We have feasts and famines. Um, luckily, we've got a pretty good core of volunteers. Some of our volunteers have given almost 20 years service with us. Um, uh, 15, 10 years is, is quite common, which is sort of one of the things you sort of look back and say, well, we must be doing something right um, to, to keep these volunteers engaged with us. So um, that's that's where I'm sort of looking at. We do have feasts and famines and I'll be quite honest, sometimes it can be a bit sticky. <laughs> oh goodness. Alrighty. Well thank you so much for your question, Richard. And we might move to the final stage of the presentation then, Cole. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. On this um, um, grab, if you like, here, it's, it's just a bit of a uh, an overview of our um, yearly um, kilometres travelled, our vehicle incidents and, and the like. Now this is purely to do with our road travelling. Uh, we do get a lot of other incidents uh, with passengers that, that fall over it in their um, doorway and things like that. I haven't recorded those incidents. I've purely kept the incidents that pertain to roadways. <coughs> As you can see our uh, uh, incident line is, is pretty well a straight line. It hasn't, hasn't gone up that great. It still, still has, we still have incidents um, and our mileage when we started in 2009 was a little bit under uh, 60,000 60, or 600,000 and we're well and truly over a million uh, in 2014. In 2015 we're, we're even climbing higher again in 2016. Um, what I really want to highlight, though, 
um, yes, we have incidents. And you know the beauty about that? Our drivers are willing to let us know. Um, with, with incidents, when I first came here, um, you never had many incidents. You, the only time you ever heard of anything really bad if something really bad happened. When, when you start to analyse what's happening, usually the, the volunteers would say to me, oh, I'll get blamed for that, or I'll, I'll be responsible. And it's a fair enough comment because I'm sure in, in their other working life, that's how most, most of the um, incident reporting was ever treated. It was like a big stick thing from the uh, employer. You guys have had an accident you shouldn't have and things like that. The other thing is the volunteers would say to me, what's the good of writing an incident report? It, it just goes into the never-never and never hear any more. And that's a fair enough comment. So, so what we do now... Um, after we, we, all our incidents are tabled at a work health and safety meeting. Incidents, hazards, accidents. It's all the one form. We, we used to have three forms, would you believe? And you can imagine a volunteer carrying around three forms in the vehicle trying to decide which one he wants to fill out. So what we did, we simplified it. We just put tick boxes at the top of the form, whether it was an incident, whether it was an accident, whether it was a hazard report. And from that, we could, we could then, um, analyse what we needed to do. We present all reports at our Work Health and Safety Committee meeting. We discuss it at the meeting. If it's something really um, important or, or urgent, it's discussed well before it gets to Work Health and Safety Committee. If it's something that's um, really, really urgent, uh, it gets to my desk within, within hours and then we can um, make the necessary um, things to do with, with that particular incident. With our incidents, and I really can't show you clearly here, but all these incidents that you see on the, on the scale, they're mainly all reversing incidents. Low speed, reversing out of car parks, hitting a bollard, reversing out of a, uh, a driveway, hitting a mailbox. Very seldom is it vehicle vehicle contact. Sometimes it is, just minor stuff, um, like a vehicle's run into the back of our vehicle, uh, parked at a roundabout. It does happen. We never proportion blame to our drivers. We have a good look at what's actually happened and, and then we look at ways we can uh, A, improve or B, um, mitigate that problem. And I really believe putting everybody in charge of work health and safety, that's the drivers and uh, volunteers, um, that's where it's got us. That's, that's where we're, uh, we've moved ahead. As I said, creating the right culture is crucial to any work health and safety activity in vehicles. You need to involve all the staff, all the volunteers, in owning safe work practices, not just leave it up to a few who are responsible for work health and safety. Another important thing is to be open to ideas and input from volunteers um, and staff and be preferred, prepared to embrace those changes. Um, I've got a, I'm very happy I've got a, um, an office that has a window and the driver's lounge is, is just through the window and the drivers will, will roll in any old time of day. They'll say hello. I'll come and sit down and, and give, I always give them five minutes at least, no matter what I'm doing. If it's an if it's important thing for, for the uh, CEO, that can wait. Uh, so I give the drivers a chance to say what they feel. The, the thing that really shows up, the hazard that these guys identify and it can only, you know, it's, it could be there the whole time but uh, it only comes to light when uh, someone outside it takes a notice and notices that hazard and say, you know, this is it's not real, real flash, this going on. Um, it gives you time to um, reflect and, and make changes. This is a shot of just some of our volunteers. Um, I 
I want to just show that we, we do have real people that are in our organisation, uh, some of our vehicles in the background. Um, this is only a very small percentage of, of our, our guys. Um, and the thing is, I'm very proud to be associated with these people and the way that they're associated with community transport. Volunteers are the backbone of our organisation in providing transport for the community. As I said earlier on, all we do is give them the mechanism, the safe workplace, to be able to volunteer um, safely and to give back to the community. What's on the way? What's, what's coming? As the question was asked earlier on, what are we looking at? Uh, we're looking at better technology all the time, um, efficient vehicles. Our present fleet, we have five hybrid Camrys in our fleet. We have diesel vehicles. Um, we, we got the question mark on electric vehicles, whether that's going to be something for the future. Um, but just a word on our um, Camrys. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's those out there that would be interested. Um, the average uh, litres per, per hundred is 5.8 5 litres per hundred with our Camrys. Uh, conversely, with um, a diesel I-30, they run at 6. So we're getting some pretty good figures uh, in fuel. With the Subaru Foresters, we run at around about 10, 10 to 11. Uh, depending on the area they're, they're working out of. Um, we, we try and balance uh, efficiencies with our vehicles as against um, transporting our passengers. Uh, we did have a um, Kia Grand Carnival, which is wheelchair modified. Um, it, it really loved fuel. It was 15 litres, 20 litres um, per hundred but we still held the vehicle because it was so good for wheelchair passengers. They could actually ride in a vehicle and feel they're part of the, uh, the cabin. They're up close to the driver and the other passengers. We are looking into the future of going onto onboard vehicle systems um, to eliminate the, the paper wastage of printing out run sheets for our drivers. Uh, we're going to have, uh, similar to a taxi system, where the actual uh, run comes out on a screen and also we're having uh, GPS tracking uh, as, a, as an offshoot. A few of our drivers got the big brother is watching attitude and true, that is true, we are going to be big brother watching our, our vehicles but when you explain the rationale behind uh, when we've got uh, a vehicle say down, down at the hospital for instance and um, at the present time now we get um, get a call to transport a passenger from the hospital. Uh, the coordinator is, is trying to guess where where their driver is. Um, they might pick a driver who's on the other side of town to actually go and pick up the passenger because they think the vehicle that's at the hospital is actually out on a job in another area. So we're looking at improving our efficiencies via the onboard vehicle system. Um, so we're open to, to what's new, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, as I said, the, the Tesla vehicles and all this sort of caper is all interesting sort of stuff, but uh, it's, it's for the future, I think. And that just about um, sorts me out with my presentation, uh, Angela, if uh, any more questions. <laughs> Uh, Cole, congratulations on successfully implementing uh, this initiative and for overcoming the challenges that you have to, to make it so. And, and thank you especially for taking the time to, to share your story and experience with our listeners today. Hopefully uh, there's a few tips and, and tricks that maybe they can uh, implement in their respective workplaces. We have one last question for you, Cole, which has come through. And I must admit, uh, just to let the audience know, when Cole sort of stepped up to do this, he's going, well, what is there for me to talk about? Um, I, I, this is just common sense for me. And I'm like, you've got a fantastic story and NRSCP is proud to tell it and, and hopefully share it with other sort of people. And I think here's a good sort of question that sort of draws on this. Is um, It's from Julie. Do you have a retirement age for volunteer drivers? Ah, the old retirement age question. <laughs> <laughs> we, 
we got to a point with some of our volunteers that you know, we were having drivers in their 80s, <coughs> driving passengers in their 70s. And we thought, gee, that's that's a little bit odd. You know, it's it's a bit daunting for the passenger thinking, well, I've got a got a real old old guy driving me. Um, oh. But under the um, legislation of uh, you can't use age as a discriminating tool, um, it's it's very hard to impress upon a person who's really got nothing else to do in their day. And honestly, this is this is where I'm I'm saying we drag. Uh, a lot of retirees who really have nothing to do in their day and they love coming and being with us and transporting people in the community because it gives them something to do. Um, it's very hard to, to say to a, a person who is um, elderly driving, uh, what, we, what we fall back on of course is our driving assessments. We get our um, driving assessment done more regularly on people that are that are aged or we feel um, perhaps shouldn't be driving and from that assessment process usually the the volunteers themselves realise I'm getting too old to do this job because the assessor does go through a pretty gruelling assessment as I said it takes up to an hour uh, driving high speed roundabouts parking pulling out from curbs and also getting to know the road rules. So we do tend to weed out our more early drivers. Um, it's very hard um, to say to a, a very early driver, really we, we need to um, move you on. But what we do do with them, we offer them uh, to be bus carers, to be, to be travelling on the bus with our uh, shopping bus and things like that, um, so they can still have the interaction with with community, and that has worked too. Uh, we've actually been able to move a couple of our drivers who really, really want to be involved with community transport. Still, we still give them the opportunity, uh, not as drivers but as carers on buses or um, things like that. Well, that's fantastic. Just like you care for the community, you care for your people, and um, certainly making them feel very valued and 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 cared about. So, thank you for doing so. Thank you for sharing your story again. Um, and just on that note, we might finish up today's webinar session. So, I once again thank our presenter. His details are there on your screen, and I'm sure he wouldn't be opposed to being contacted if uh, anyone wishes to discuss any questions further. Would that be okay, Cole? <laughs> Certainly, I have no secrets. Um, uh, as, as I said, with our DVD, uh, I encourage everybody to go and have a look at our DVD. It gives us a pretty good snapshot of uh, what we are on the North Coast, but it also gives some good messages in our, in our training. Uh, and I'm always willing to uh, speak to anybody. Thank you, Cole. And I'll certainly make sure that link gets out to anyone who missed it earlier in the presentation. Uh, thank you, for Jerome, for joining me in the studio. And, Always um, a pleasure, and thank you, Cole. And <laughs> we hope you can join us for future NRSPP webinars in the months to come. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.